to a substantial extent with the percentage of the diaspora. But you cannot change certain people who are very intransigent, particularly people who have made terrorism funding a business. So I don't think that is the answer. That is part of the answer. And in terms of, I, I must uh, take you on on your previous uh, worry. Yes, but you live in a different country. You see, the difference is this, that there are media laws, there are particular laws pertaining to Britain, and we have to work within the confines of those laws. It is in that context that, the, uh, that uh, a legal option has not been pursued. And that is not up to me, I'm not a lawyer, that is up to the legal experts. And they are those who have taken the view in the context of the l domestic laws of that country. So I can assure you, I mean, we can have a long discussion with you afterwards, but that is the view that has been taken depending on the laws of that country. So anyway, just to answer that question, and a substantial amount has been done with the, uh, with the diaspora. But you have to remember, there is a substantial amount of funding going on. And time, I think, is another thing that we'll heal. The other is when people come to the country, and that is the very purpose of having uh, Chogham 2013. And we have worked extremely hard for the last two years, might I add. I, sat on the, I, I chaired the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Just to let you know, the 53 or 54 London-based High Commissioners are called the Board of Governors, and they sit on the, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and I chaired that for the first year. And for the last year, I was the Deputy Chair of the Executive Committee. We have worked relentlessly, ceaselessly, with the Commonwealth High Commissioners to ensure, particularly, that they're appraised of this, particularly prior to the Perth Conference, when it was reaffirmed that we would be hosting Chogham. We worked tirelessly, even prior to all those issues regarding the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group. These things don't come to us on a plate. They come by enormous intensive lobbying uh, behind the scenes, and also to appraise people, to appraise people of the reality of contemporary Sri Lanka. So a lot of work has been done uh, regarding that, and I think we're seeing the fruits of that, I'm happy to say, by Chogham 2013 happening in Sri Lanka. All right, we'll go to Shehan in the back. Well, uh, Your Excellency, I think uh, in terms of the authenticity, there are a lot, so many questions with regard to the Channel 4. Uh, everybody knows about it. But however, the, 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 the issue is here, Your Excellency, in terms of taking litigation. Uh, well, even though you say it's a fiction and also Star Wars, yes, we also know, it's, you know. But the British Prime Minister himself has taken that footage as a footnote to accuse Sri Lanka. Now that is a danger point he is making. He himself takes this as authentic. Yesterday at his press conference he, he very categorically said, so does it mean then the Sri Lanka should alarm and take legal action on this? Because if the British Prime Minister himself take this serious, then why not Sri Lanka take this serious and go ahead with the litigation? No, uh, the point is this. I think you're missing the point. The question is whether litigation within the laws of that country is the best option to take and whether it will work according to the media laws of that country. That is an entirely separate issue as to, from the issue as to whether anyone, whether it is the British Prime Minister or any opinion leader, quotes the Channel 4 footage. You have to understand there are two entirely different issues. The decision regarding litigation, the re decision regarding the need for so the imperative for something to be done is entirely different from the decision as to whether litigation will succeed within the confines of the laws of that country. And that decision has been taken time and time again by legal experts. That is an entirely different thing as to whether someone, many people quote fit footage, many people are sometimes misguided, some people are misinformed, but many people quote things. People quote the Darisman report as a UN report. It was not a formally authenticated UN report. It was, never, it was never requested formally by the UN. It was a private report. Many people quote that. Many people don't quote that section within the U Darisman report itself that says that those things within it are written in the form of a narrative and require a higher threshold to be considered evidence. That's the most damning sentence in that entire Derosman report. But who quotes it? Because the majority of people don't read the report. They just read the sound bites and use the sound bites. That is why it is important that we continue engagement 
with the press and by the press. And the, incidentally, there's nothing to stop all of you if Channel 4 is so aggressive here. It is a peripheral marginal TV station. There's nothing to stop you all doing the same with those countries to question why things are said. And I, uh, I think that if you all uh, in the media have an enormous role to play in challenging uh, some of these uh, extremely dubious viewpoints. But that is an entirely different issue, and I don't think this is the forum to get involved in the legality of Channel 4. I think we should go on to just questions that can be answered. I've already said the view regarding Channel 4 was taken already, and it will continue to be taken. But that's a different issue from whether we should place enormous importance on Channel 4 or not. The viewership, let me tell you, not on this last showing, of their latest one, but last year we got some statistics. That Channel 4 video on Sri Lanka, which was sort of emblazoned as uh, you know, and yet another damning report, do you, uh, and that all of the British were affected by it. Do you know during that on that showing that day at 11 o'clock at night, the readership for the Channel 4 movie was a few thousand people, something like 30, 30,000, 40,000 people. On that same day, the viewership for the cookery program was a few hundred thousand people, and a viewership for a football match was 850,000 people. That will give you an index of how irrelevant Channel 4 is. So it is your duty to understand the context, and what we need to do is to move on with contemporary Sri Lanka and the beauty of Sri Lanka now. We don't need to be defensive about people who give us unauthenticated stuff in the first place. What we can do is publicize more the hard fact about the progress we have made in the country and what we intend to do, and I think that is what is important. His Excellency the President will chair the Commonwealth for the next two years. The theme, growth with equity, inclusive development, is a very powerful theme that was chosen because it demonstrates what our commitment is to Commonwealth values. We believe in the principles enshrined in the Singapore Declaration of 1971, in the Harare Declaration of 1991. When the president achieved peace in the country in 2009, we asserted the greatest human right, which was the right to life. Because after asserting that human right, for four years there's not been a single terrorist attack. Secondly, by the president achieving peace in the country in May 2009, we subscribed to the first fundamental principle enshrined in the uh, Singapore Declaration of 1971 and the Harare Declaration of 1991, which is a commitment to international peace and security. That is important. We also subscribe, and I believe, in the Munyono Statement for Respect and Understanding, which was released after the uh, Uganda Chogam. Because there, the Nobel laureate, Amartya Sen, wrote about the importance of respecting the diversity of each and every one of us. And that is the message we move forward with uh, as head of the Commonwealth. What we understand is two things. Number one, we understand when we head the Commonwealth that all Commonwealth countries are at different stages of development. We need to have an empathy and understanding of that. And we need to move forward to unite the Commonwealth countries, not to divide. That is the most important point. The second point, we understand that all countries are different and all people are different because it is when we respect each other's diversity that we give each other dignity. And it is when we give each other dignity that we will ensure a durable world peace. And it is that message of unity and development and the attending to the imperatives of development in the majority of Commonwealth countries. It is with that message that we will move forward as chair of the Commonwealth. And that is what is important for us to focus on. We just have time for one more question because I think a lot of you have to also um, go. Hand up there. I'm, Ra I'm Rangaya Surya from Ceylon today. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Actually, you have been very generous, I would say, about on your remarks about Britain and our contemporary and uh, uh, historical legacy between our two countries. And also, I would say you have been very rational in your approach towards how to tackle the diaspora, but that is not what we exactly hear in this country, at least from most articulate members of the government, uh, among the government interlocutors. And uh, 
for instance uh, recently we